Hi, I'm Ed Sproing. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Steve Wu. We're going to talk today about the road to superchips. Steve, what is a superchip? How does that differ from where we were in the past? Yeah, a superchip is really a, a collection of chips that are kind of uh, assembled together into one larger chip that allows us to get much higher performance and much, many more capabilities than the, the reticle limited chips uh, of the past. A lot of this being driven by AI, is that where a lot of this started? Yeah, uh, AI is a big driver for this kind of thing. Really, uh, AI and high performance computing are the places that uh, we need to see those boundaries broken. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Steve, where are we today and how did we get here? Uh, great question, yeah. So what I'm showing here is where we've been in the past. And uh, this shows uh, for, in the past when we had kind of large AI jobs or large high performance computing jobs, we would split them among multiple chips. And in the past, we would have um, GPUs that were reticle limited or basically they're the largest uh, size of chip that you could manufacture. And you would put some amount of high performance memory, in this case, like HBM. And then we would take multiple of these uh, kind of assemblies and have them communicate with each other back and forth. It turns out when you're uh, just staying with on, within your chip, things are great. You're keeping all the computation local and the high bandwidth memory uh, was able to provide the kind of performance that you need to move the data back and forth. The problem that started to happen is that this communication between these GPUs is very time consuming and it, it becomes much more of a bottleneck. And so the question started to become, um, as I was having more and more of these GPUs that I was splitting my problem over, I was becoming more and more limited by the communication that was going on between these chips. So something had to happen. And moving data is one of the big problems here, right? It always has been. Yeah, data movement is the key problem, both for performance and for power. And now you have a lot more data to move than you did in the past. Yeah, there, there's no shortage of data in the world. And especially with these much larger uh, AI models, the training sets are enormous. So it's important to be able to move that data quickly because that's often the limiter and that's often why the GPUs are waiting. And also in the past, we mostly went with SRAM, but SRAM doesn't scale. So now you've got HBM. How much of an impact does that take? Yeah, so of course we would like it if we could do everything with SRAM because it's extremely fast, but there's only so much SRAM that you can put on a chip. The explosive growth in the size of models and in our training sets in particular uh, means that you really can't use just SRAM anymore. Um, really, you have to use external DRAM. And for these types of problems, the highest bandwidth memories, HBM and uh, to some extent GDDR, those are the memories of choice right now. So how does this evolve? Yeah, let me show you, uh, you know, where we've gone to today. So, you know, I mentioned that that communication, the movement of data between the chips is the problem. So this is what gave rise to the superchip. The idea here is that we can take multiple of our reticle limited die and put them right next to each other on a common substrate. And that's what you see today in systems like uh, the Blackwell GPU, for example. What this allows us to do is in a single assembly, we can now do much more work, but we're no longer limited by the long distance that we have to communicate data between. You can see with them being right next to each other, uh, the shorter distance that the data has to move, it improves the performance and it reduces the amount of power you're spending moving data back and forth between those assemblies. People have always talked about superchips, though. You think about going way back into, uh, hey, here's the next Pentium that's coming out or whatever it happens to be. What's changed now? Yeah, really what's changed now is better packaging technology and better assembly technology. So uh, now is the right kind of time. Uh, it's really a bit of an extension over what we've seen with HBM memory packaging. So, uh, you know, the, the experience that the industry has gained with HBM packaging and assembly has really helped the industry to understand how to do these kinds of super chip assemblies. There's also talk about customize HBM2, right? How does that fit into this picture? Yeah, I think there's always these questions about, um, is there some more you can do in the HBM memory itself? Maybe uh, since it's storing all the data, maybe there's some amount of actual processing that you can do. And we have seen work from people like Samsung with Aquabolt uh, and people like SK Hynix in their GDDR memories as well, trying to do some local compute right inside the memories. And what you're trying to do there is if I can do some amount of compute, I can aggregate and take uh, really uh, its higher value data that's been processed and send it back over to the processor. 
So really, you want to be able to reduce the amount of data you're moving wherever you possibly can, right? That's right. And one way to do that is to process um, near the data or, um, uh, in some cases, right inside the memory. But it is challenging. There are uh, a number of, uh, of challenges with being able to do that well. But it's a, an industry direction that uh, people have talked about for many years. And uh, I, I think given the limitations we've just talked about, it's a direction that people will continue to look in the near future. Yeah, from a design standpoint, this sounds very complex because now you've got very concentrated dynamic power, right? That's right, and uh, there needs to be uh, much more coordination between the processor and the memory itself, uh, and there needs to be, uh, really, standards would be a great thing to have here in terms of um, you know, allowing interoperability between different vendors' parts uh, and uh, allowing uh, it's kind of a, a common framework for programmers to be able to use. So where do you see the challenges? Which, what are they? Yeah, I, I think some of the biggest challenges here um, are, you know, although it's great in terms of improving performance, there's a lot of power uh, that needs to be put into a small area now. So one of the biggest challenges for the industry is the increase in power density. So we're going to be dissipating a lot more power in a smaller area. Uh, and so not only do you have to be able to deliver a higher amount of power, you also have to be able to cool it. There's been a lot of talk about power delivery and cooling, cooling in particular, because you've got all these complex uh, new ways of doing things. Where are we now and, and how does that solve the problem? Yeah, so one of the biggest changes that we're starting to see in the data center is the move from 12 volts to 48 volt power delivery. What that does is it allows us to keep the current that's coming across the wires and into the servers much more manageable. Now, if we, if we stayed at 12 volt uh, power, we would need four times as much current uh, to give the same power at 48 volts. Uh, and so that would actually cause the wires to melt. So the move to 48 volts in some ways is, is really a necessity to uh, continue to provide much more power in the same kind of volume as we see today. And this is really that power is necessary to drive the signals, right? That's really where you're coming up with the higher power. Yeah, it's, it's really for a lot of things. It's to move the data. It's to do the computations on the chip. Um, it's really to just get that current in there uh, so that the, the circuits can actually uh, toggle. You've also got much thinner substrates. You've got thinner dielectrics than you had before. How does that play into this? Yeah, so uh, the process technology challenges are also there. And so uh, really there's a kind of a coordination in the industry between the power delivery and the process technology as well to support everything. And really um, there's, there's other components that are going to be needed to step the power down from 48 volts to uh, what the chips need, which will be, you know, one volt or sub one volt, uh, as well as the other components that are in the box as well. So you've got this much power, how do you cool it? There's a lot of ideas out there, but which ones actually work? Yeah, so, um, you know, today uh, a lot of the cooling is done by air cooling, but I think with the kind of densities we're talking about, we're seeing more and more systems adopting liquid cooling. So some piped liquid that goes to a heat sink that wicks away the heat, and, you know, liquids are great in terms of their heat capacity. So. Um, you know, you see this with uh, Grace Blackwell, for example, but there are other systems uh, that, use, uh, that use liquid like the Google TPU. So it's, it's a way to address the, uh, the higher power uh, that's being dissipated. But, you know, as a, you know the, the benefit, of course, is, is that you get much higher performance. So liquid cooling has been around for decades. What's changed, though, is that it's now no longer just the box that you're cooling, right? That's right. I mean, these chips themselves are dissipating incredible amounts of power. And so the power density or the area over which that power is dissipated is much, much smaller. And so those kinds of densities are well beyond what air cooling can really handle economically. And that's why there's so much more of an emphasis now on looking at liquids. And so in effect, what you've done is you've gotten granular with cooling like you have with everything else that goes into a design now, right? Yeah, that's right. In the really past, we would have had multiple engines that were physically separated to try and help spread out that power. But the, the energy spent communicating and the hit to performance is too high. So the understanding is we need to draw things together to increase that compute density. But of course, the challenge then is how do you cool it? So Steve, where do we go next? Yeah, so we talked about some of the challenges around data movement. And even with the superchips reducing the distance, what starts to become the limiter there is really still communicating between the processors and memory. So the memory is next to the processor. And even though those distances seem like they're short, 
the data rates are so high that still very large fractions of power are spent in the memory uh, and in the circuits that are communicating from the processor to the memory. So the next step, you know, one thing, uh, one area that the industry is investigating is really how do I continue to get these historic improvements over time? And the re realization now is that communicating with memory, even though the memory is next to the processor, is a big limiter. And so one area people are looking at is what if we could stack the memory right on top of the processor? If I can do that, I can take the distances that the, pro uh, the, the memory and the processor communicate over, uh, it drops by about uh, two orders of magnitude in terms of distance. And that has a, uh, an incredible effect on the, um, on the power. Is it better to go memory on top of processor or processor on top of memory? Yeah, it's a great question. I think, uh, I think the belief right now is that putting memory on top of the processor is the, is the better choice. Uh, but there are a lot of challenges. So um, delivering the power up through to the memory is a challenge. Um, and of course, cooling the whole assembly is a challenge as well. And DRAM is notoriously anti-heat, right? Yeah, I mean, that's another one of the challenges is that, um, you know, the retention of the data uh, is limited by uh, or, or is, is affected by temperature. And so something that looks, you know, that's bonded close like this, there's going to be some challenge in trying to make sure that the DRAMs don't overheat. And it's not just the DRAM on top of the processor, the DRAM itself, the stacks of HBM now have logic in there as well, right? That's right. And so um, there's interesting questions about if you were able to do something like this, like put the memory right on top of a processor, maybe you won't need that base layer anymore. Uh, but it's kind of an open question for the industry. What does that do to the FIs? Any impact on the FI? Yeah, that's a great question. So the FI has become simpler because uh, you're driving over a much shorter distance. But the other thing that's really interesting about it is now I can use the entire area of the memory to, to drive data back and forth between the processor and the memory itself. So now uh, if you think about normally we send data through the edges of chips, now we're sending it through the whole area. And by having many more IOs, it gives me two potential benefits. One is I could run the IOs a little slower because I have so, much, so many more of them, it's a whole area. The other is that I can really get at all of the bandwidth that's uh, uh, in the DRAMs above me because I have that whole area to transmit the data. So um, I think the FIs get simpler and then in return, uh, you get the potential for much more performance with an assembly like this. Does it get easier to move the data if you have backside power delivery here too? Yeah, you know, I, I think um, delivering power is really gonna be one of the key technologies going forward. Um, uh, you know, stacked assemblies like this make it very difficult because um, the, the DRAM devices, they're not, uh, they're not in this particular assembly, they're not connected directly to a substrate. They're connected to a processor, which means the power has to pass through the processor into the memories. And so, um, you know, some of these newer techniques like backside power delivery and all that, uh, they're gonna help in these kinds of cases, but there still needs to be much more work to try and figure out how to really effectively power these devices once they're all in the stack. When you look at Moore's Law, it's really been, particularly for the past 15 years or so, it's really been one-off type of gains that you've changed materials, you've changed architectures. Is this just one more, or does this now have legs for multiple? You know, if the industry can work through the challenges here, it will be something that will provide a big jump in terms of performance. And again, you know, the, in terms of AI performance, there's been about a three-order of magnitude improvement over the last about 10 years. And so the industry is really asking itself, well, how do we get the next three orders of magnitude gain in, you know, hopefully not 10 years, but, you know, maybe if it has to be 10 years. And it's going to come through, uh, I think, discontinuous architecture innovations like this that are going to be providing some big jumps to help us get there. And you're really looking at, instead of just a chip, now you're looking at a system, right? Yeah, it's really um, a module assembly, right? And so now this super chip um, you know, is really a, a collection of reticle limited processors with their memory that's tightly integrated into that assembly. So big challenges are now what, mechanical as well as timing? Yeah, thermal, mechanical, and assembly are all going to be big challenges. And so, uh, and then of course power delivery is going to be a big one as well. But it's, you know, it's really one of the things that the semiconductor industry has been historically very good at is, uh, you know, kind of whittling away at the problems and figuring out over time you know, how to address each of them to make these things a reality.
There's been a big push toward more software-defined hardware. Is that fit into this as well? Well, I think, uh, I think the thing that becomes interesting is co-design where the application developers have to start to become much more architecturally aware of what they're writing for. So they can make sure they're minimizing the movement of data and that they can keep things local. And then on the flip side, the hardware folks uh, have to take a look more closely at what the software is trying to do and make sure that the hardware features that are, uh, that are built into these kinds of assemblies really are um, uh, doing the kinds of things that the applications need. So it, really with co-design, uh, that's kind of the, the big topic now going into the future is that we just want to make sure with the hardware that is being assembled that uh, performance isn't being left on the table because there's kind of a mismatch between what the application wants to do and what the hardware is capable of doing. Steve Wu, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks very much.